Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 3, Episode 9, titled Baby Blues. A very somber and disheartening episode of Miami Vice. It's good, but sad storyline. So you guys are in for a Go With The Heat episode. It's a little bit more serious, probably. (laughs) This episode originally premiered on November 21st, 1986. I'm going to go to the writers first. The writers are Dick Wolf and Michael Duggan. So our producers, they also teleplayed the last episode. There, Dick Wolf is pretty much a writer on three quarters of the episode in this season. The and, direct- and that's not a surprise to me because Law & Order did a very similar episode, mm. uh, at least plot wise. I even made a comment during this episode, like they're going to do it on this evidence the DA would have the cop's ass in law and order on this one. Yeah, he was talking about like, <laughs> which DA. Oh, like, he would have to go down there. I'm like, well, like, we're not on law and order, all right? <laughs> That's not even going to come did up. A much, they did a much more thorough job as far as the legal stuff on the law and order side. <laughs> yeah, for sure, yeah. <laughs> the director is Daniel Adius. Now, this man, this director is amazing. This was the first thing he ever directed on TV. He went on to have and is still having an amazing directing and producing career. This is a short segment, short compared to how much is on it, of TV shows he has directed episodes for. 21 Jump Street, Beauty and the Beast, Jake the Fat Man, 90210, Melrose Place, Party of Five, Buffy, Alias, The Wire, Entourage, House, and 16 episodes of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. It's like a list wow. of my favorites. Yeah. Like all the shows I watch. <laughs> Except for Alias. I don't watch that crap. <laughs> the only ones you don't watch are the ones that I probably watch. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I know you watch Beauty and the Beast. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Melrose Place. I didn't look at what episodes he directed of The Wire, but they were mostly in season one and two. So it might be Ooh, some of some our like favorites. Power ones. Two. Um, oh, yeah. It is amazing. And if you go look at his Wikipedia and you see how many TV shows he's directed or produced, the list is massive. Yeah, it was like you kept scrolling and scrolling and scrolling when you yes. were showing it to me. He is he is the closest to TV royalty as that we've had for directors. Obviously, Michael Mann and Dick Wolf. But yeah. But, but I mean, this guy, this is as accomplished as you can get for TV. Definitely. And I think they picked the right storyline to have him on, too. You don't want some... <laughs> some of the previous directors haven't <laughs> taken stuff so serious. You mean the director from French Twist wouldn't have cut it on this no, one? No, no, I don't think so. No. <laughs> Before we get started, we can check in. Someone's going to each other's lives. And guys, this is an 80s podcast. We are into... We, we follow 80s things. And we did one of the most 80s traditions ever tonight. Is that we watched SummerSlam. We Super Bowl partied it. We even yes. had snacks and everything. Yes, it was, we made it into a big deal. Mm-hmm. We had all the snacks out, following it on Twitter, watching the live stream. It was like I was eight years old all over again, watching the Ultimate Warrior. Dreaming because we were poor when we were eight. No, <laughs> <laughs> well, that was eight. Uh-huh. <laughs> we couldn't pay for no pay per view. No. <laughs> so yes, I saw it on know, a tape. It's funny to that too with the, with the uh, Ultimate Warrior because I want to say that that was my eighth birthday theme and <laughs> it was the Ultimate Warrior. And I want to say even my cake was the Ultimate Warrior. And my mom had used like a Superman shaped pan. <laughs> and turned him into the ultimate warrior. Wow. That's like dream birthday. I love the ultimate warrior now. That that's why it sticks out to me cuz it's still one of like it was like one of my best birthdays. And you know me and Melissa were talking while we were watching SummerSlam that you know what's missing from modern WWE even though it's still a lot of fun and we de- and we did see Braun Strowman throw away office chair that at was amazing. Roman Reigns. <laughs> you know what's missing from modern wrestling is that soap opera e over the top personalities that they had in the 80s that they really don't have anymore you know what you want what it is it's the pageantry yeah right it's like the it's randy it's macho man randy savage coming out with people carrying him in that case right yeah and then you've yeah. got miss elizabeth with him and it's like the oh it's the king and queen and <laughs> like they don't have any of that stuff <laughs> and they don't and, have like the i i mean i hate to say it i like i still like i like wrestling i still get into it i watch it obviously because i like it and i like i mean that's why we got our son into it it's because of me <laughs> but where are the storylines where like when the hulkster got like his brain damage and thought he was a bad guy and then he was with razor ramon in the <laughs> yes. nwa and then and then he snapped out of it and became my, a good guy my again. favorite is when that he was attacked i remember this vividly it was on a saturday morning episode 
and he was attacked in the parking lot and they ran him over with a car and I went and ran into my parents' bedroom, busted open the door. And I was like, <laughs> Hulk Hogan's dead. <laughs> like I was convinced he was dead because they ran him over. And my dad's like, no, he's not dead. And I was crying in tears. My dad's like, no, watch. Come on, let's go back. Let's go back and watch. And then they come back to it out of commercial break and they have a bed set up probably at the stadium where they're at. <laughs> and it's like all this like fake wires and stuff attached to him. He's got a big bandage around his head and yeah. they bring him in and they're like, he barely made it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one that I remember the most was, and I remember it was a big rivalry between Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior. Mm -hmm. And like when I was a kid, it was like you were either a fan of the Warrior or you were a fan of Hogan. And I remember they, they did a big storyline. It was like for a month or two of like the ultimate warrior had some some curse or something put on him and he oh, was like yeah like sick yeah the yeah, voodoo like guy he was like he put sick. that curse on the him. voodoo guy yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I, remember I remember that being so it, worried about that <laughs> yeah it was like he came into his dressing room he came into his dressing room and that voodoo guy was hiding in there and he like did something to him and then mm -hmm. And then after that, he was sick, and they're like, it was like a huge comeback. We just watched Demetrius. We have the WWE channel, obviously, and so we just watched that WrestleMania oh, yeah. <laughs> when he came back, and it was like them two were fighting. It was like they, they couldn't outmatch each other. It was like equal match. So mm -hmm. it would be like they would he would grab Hulk Hogan's fists and he would hold them, and Hulk Hogan would do the same, and they'd be like, Ugh, like locked in. <laughs> yeah, he's locked in for a long time. <laughs> for uh -huh. a really long time. Well, someday the. We'll hopefully feel like that the WWE will get back to that, not Brock Lesnar holding on to the Universal title. Baloney. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's really an easy way to segue into what this episode is about. Let's just just know that we're going to start off with people stealing babies. So let's go talk about this very somber and dark episode of Miami Vice. All right. So when we open the episode, we're in Colombia. And there's just people going about their business, taking a bus, going through the farmlands. A uh, fancy limo comes pulling up, honking the horn, and makes the bus stop. It's like, all right, it's Columbia. This is Miami Vice. This is probably going to be about drugs. You know, someone's a drug mule or something like that. And these armed men get out of the car, run onto the bus, and start stealing people's babies. Was it just me or were there a lot of babies in that bus? Yeah, that's okay. true. <laughs> it came out with like seven babies. <laughs> they didn't have enough arms to hold the babies. There was like one guy was holding three babies it, at one point. Uh, what I was wondering, and I don't know, this may, maybe this sounds a little callous. Right off the bat. No. How, how do they? How, how are they priced the babies? Because they in one of the very next scenes, they show uh, the American guy, or, mm -hmm. or uh, I'm assuming American, and he's like looking through the babies, and he's like, oh, this one, oh, look at you, aren't you? You so cute oh give this one back to the mom <laughs> are, are there discount babies do you, do, are they like fruit do you squeeze their heads well, then, <laughs> so two points there one that comes up later because he's known for being like brutal like, he, like he's selling commodities yeah. that's the way he looks at it because yeah. he talks about how like when the ones that died it's like it's you have some loss like there's some spoilage he calls it yeah yeah exactly two that one is doubly brutal because the woman with that child gets out of the back of the bus and tries to run for it then a man chases her down pushes her down punches her yeah takes yeah. the baby takes it back over to familia and familia goes yeah that's an ugly baby send it back clearly the baby they showed at the end was the ugliest i'm <laughs> joking i'm joking <laughs> so right out of the Throughout gate this episode we're going to be ranking the babies from ugliest <laughs> not <laughs> well so this one isn't going to win any beauty pageants but you know, you know. well and <laughs> Famiglia is talking about he's you hear you overhear his conversation saying, oh, you're going to get a Porsche for your 16th birthday. So we find out right away they're stealing babies they are taking to Miami and then they're going to be auctioned essentially yeah. to rich people. Which it seems like a lot of rich people can't have babies. It's yeah. Strange. I mean, interesting. I, I thought that was a little weird. <laughs> Only, they have no poor people that want babies. I mean, I don't get it. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Miami, the entire vice team. Plus, the army is waiting. Those are like SWAT. They're just wearing. <laughs> yeah. They're waiting at the airport, which is funny because the SWAT's in like camo with camo face paint on. And the ladies, ladies are in their nice dress attire. Yeah, I have problems with when they dress them. Like, I mean, I get that they're supposed to be, hey, we're ladies, but we can still do the job. 
Mm-hmm. But I feel like as ladies who do but, the job, they'd be like, I ain't running in these heels. I'm going to put on regular yeah. damn shoes so yeah. I can get there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to be out there in like my camo gear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, do you not own regular clothes that are not Hooker Avenue clothes? Is that the deal? Like, I mean, yeah. like they, that's just how they go to work. They don't like they don't think they're going to have to run or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I also appreciate uh-huh. that in the general Miami area, there's literally abandoned air, air yeah. strips. What? In every direction. And where like, are these airstrips? Just at? <laughs> make, just take any choice, just any of them. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, they never talk about like who told them to go there either, right? Do they talk about that? No. Only thing that they mention is that they are anticipating that this is a drug deal. Yes. So they've been working a case. They've come to this airfield. A plane is landing. They think that this is going to be a drug bust. Yeah, that's what they're waiting for. Yeah. I feel like Izzy must have given them this information. <laughs> <laughs> Man gets out of the airplane. They just yell vice and shoot. So, I, I'm pretty sure they, as soon as they say that word, it makes their trigger finger pull back. Tubbs, as soon as his step like opens the door, Tubbs is like, Miami Vice! Gang, 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 gang. And then shoots him. It's like, how are you getting any information when you shoot everybody yeah, first? Just, yeah, they just start mowing people down. And my thought is, is you're firing bullets at the plane. What if there's something that could explode? You know, drugs aren't known to be, you know, stored uh, or manufactured uh, in a way that doesn't make them flammable. Yeah, exactly. You know, or I mean, God forbid if there were like babies on that plane. <laughs> yeah. Or the fact that you don't really even know what it is. Like, what if that was like literally just somebody who was landing their plane? Mm-hmm. Like they just have a com- uh, not a commercial plane, but like a private plane. And you land and some guy some yells, Miami Vice. And you're like, got wasted. <laughs> yes, I'm saying. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> Your whole crew did. They don't show us those episodes. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> they walk up to the airplane. There's another person gets out to shoot and kill them. But a cargo hold opens up and a woman falls out. So then the vice team is really confused what's going on here. They look inside and they see crates, poorly made crates. And you hear babies crying. And Trudy goes in, sees that they're smuggling babies, and then says, this one didn't make it. So not not only is there, are they smuggling babies, but they're not... There's that one that didn't, make, didn't survive. The, well, we find out sure. later, it's three. Three mm-hmm. of them didn't make it. So they're not... Three of them. Yeah, yeah. they're not taking care oh, of them. I, I, like, I'm like just going curious. This crate. Yeah, and I'm just curious. Did three of them not survive because of the trip? Or did three of them not survive because of the bullets being fired at the plane? That's a good point. No, I think they're trying to say they were already... This, But the, this is the whole thing that doesn't make any sense. I mean, to me. that's I guess... the story going with. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> I mean, as a like... No, a, no, this... they clearly shot these babies. <laughs> <laughs> Those are some strong words to be throwing around to be shooting babies. <laughs> um, no, what I'm saying is like, as a, I know, I understand that it's supposed to be like a business and like he says later on it's a loss and whatever, but... It feels like that if you were going to make, a, if the, each baby was worth at least 50 grand to you, mm-hmm. you would make sure someone was taking care of them. They would come in the best shape. Not like under the best care. These ragamuffin babies that these poor babies that they have them in these like food crates and then they yeah, go over not, feed them or like, something. <laughs> yeah. Not, not act like, you know, like you're moving across town, you know, just stuff them <laughs> yeah. in a box. Yeah. That's here. what I'm saying. Like they're stuffing them in a box. Like it doesn't seem like that would, that, that doesn't seem like a smart business practice if it's supposed to be just a business thing and you don't really that doesn't seem like your merchandise is well taken care of so after they figure out that this is a baby smuggling operation we go to the opening credits i just want to pause for a second this was totally unexpected so i know melissa you've seen this this episode before but if you look at it from the perspective of miami vice and what the show has been so far baby and child smuggling for adoption for fake adoption and laundering schemes was totally out of left field for me i did Mm -hmm. not anticipate that something so dark would be covered by Miami Vice. Not only that, but like that they covered it, but that they actually had babies die. Like that's a mm-hmm. big thing, right? There was babies that actually died. It wasn't like, hey, we found these babies. They were all fine, but they just don't belong to these people. They're being smuggled in. No, there was actually casualties of it. And that, you know, and that that sets the tone for the rest of the episode, right? How everyone acts in it. And then they have the, the talk later as it's like, what do you do with these children now that like in the case of Maria, who was the one that fell out of the airplane in the cargo hold, what do you do with the people when they find their stolen child? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I mean, I guess this was a rip from the headlines uh, episode. So, I mean, we're back to that rip from the headlines. So I guess that was a problem in the 80s. People adopting uh, or not, 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 not adopting, but illegally bringing in kids from third world countries as their own, you know, like they adopted them. I think that's still a thing that, that we're dealing with. It's still a problem. and I mean, it's, they, they talk about it a lot in, in the media. And if you, I follow a lot of people that adopt like on social media and stuff like that. 
And if you, you can still go to places that are not reputable, it's either a, they're not reputable because they're going to get these babies and you're not going to know if the parents really consented to take them because they may be like just paying off the parents. Mm-hmm. Like maybe they're not stealing them. Yes. Okay. So they're not like taking them in the middle of the night or something, but they're paying, they're buying these babies essentially so they can give them to Americans at a higher mm-hmm. price. Or there's also babies that they, they have problems with babies that are sick that they, they get and they return them. And it's like, this is crazy. It's just crazy the way things work out like that. Or they, t- or they can take your money. Like, Hey, you're going to do this adoption. It's, you know, you're, you're all set to get this child. Come to find out they never had that child. And you are out all this money Mm -hmm. and the government's not going to help you because you're not supposed to buy babies. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, Mm -hmm. it was just a surprise. Yeah. I mean, uh, honestly, the only reason I know anything about it is because of that law and order episode, which (laughs) was a formative (laughs) episode. So um, they were getting their babies from Haiti. I saw that episode. (laughs) I just wanted to mention that is it was quite surprising that they were willing to tackle this topic on Miami Vice. When we come back from the opening credits, we're at the hospital. They've taken the, the mother that was in the cargo hold. She's at the hospital. Her name is Maria, like I already mentioned. And she says that her baby was taken 16 months ago. She's been trying to find it ever since. There was It was just taken, and then this American made all these promises. There was like all this paperwork. She didn't understand what any of it meant. There was some promises. Nothing ever came through. Only thing that she knows is that the, that's the only information that she can give them is that the baby has a strawberry birthmark on his shoulder. And so that's like the only identifying feature they can do. And so now, back at the precinct, the ladies are talking to Castillo. They Trudy is mentioning that 15 babies were on the plane, three were dead, and that they think it's an adoption scam. So Castillo is, and you'll see it a little bit later, but he's already starting to feel the tension from the vice team that they are taking this extremely seriously. And I'll note, too, that the vice team that, can that's, be That's not very, what I got from Castillo. <laughs> Castillo basically said, "We don't do babies here, and that's a whole lot. That's a whole lot of not my problem." <laughs> yeah, no, he went back to his whole like, "You don't have the evidence." I said that too to Dominic. Like, they, no, they don't have the evidence. They have no evidence. That's what he's saying. Like, I don't have no evidence, and you have no evidence. I got no time for that. Like, we ain't got time for this. Yeah, yeah. He basically saying like, "This is an immigration issue. Let them deal with it." What I guess what I'm suggesting is that he can feel and he looks around a lot at the other vice members who are taking this very seriously and he's kind of caving to their demands because he sees that they're that they want to be aggressive with this so he's he keeps suggesting that there isn't enough evidence but he gets out of their way because he knows that if he doesn't there's gonna be like a riot on his hands yeah because he's castillo he's just constant what he's supposed to do and he's following the rules but when he when he's pushed and they're like, come on, we could do this and we can do that. And they're offering different things and they're all willing to do it. And they're all putting in the extra work, even the B team. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> then he's like, OK, fine, we'll try that. You know, also, we didn't see right, it last week. No overtime. <laughs> also, we didn't see it last week because the ladies weren't around. But man, when when the B team, the ladies and the duo get working on cases they take seriously, they're a fine tuned machine. Not like the other crap they mm-hmm. normally turn in week to week. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's funny about that is it, in one of the next scenes, the B team is at the adoption agency and they're collecting the paperwork. And uh, the the lady's like, well, it's a lot of paperwork. And they're kind of like, wait a minute, how much paperwork? I mean, we don't want, we don't want yeah, to do too much work. <laughs> yeah, like, like that matters. No, I don't really want to find these babies. Never mind. That's too much for me. <laughs> so... I also want to point out, you know, before we get too far along, that uh, Marie Escobar, the mother, is played by Patrice Martinez, and she was the, well, main female lead in Three Amigos with Steve <gasps> Martin. Oh, my God, oh, That's she why was. I recognize her. I was like, who is this lady I can't put my finger on where I've seen her yeah. before? She's the one that Steve Martin falls in love with. Yeah, that was her. She was also one of the main leads in the Zorro TV show for four seasons. Those are the main things you probably know her from. Sorry, I'm doing the Three Amigo dance. <laughs> 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 that's see, that's the whole time I'm watching the episode. I'm thinking, man, she looks really familiar. Where the hell do I know her from? And I looked, I was like, oh, the three amigos. She was the, she was a Car- Carmen. I want to yeah, say I think that's her name. Yeah, where they ride into town and she's like, help us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At the end of the precinct scene, the B team's off to go talk to social services, like you mentioned, John. And then the duo are going to go talk to the Colombian co- consulate. So before we go to where you mentioned in this social services we go over to the consulate and they're asking him he's 
if if the consulate has helped with adoptions, he says, yes, 20 or 25 of them in the last year. We always go through social services and there's a problem in Colombia. He tries to defend that there's parents that give away their children and then later change their minds. And there's nothing that they can do about that. Crockett and Tubbs storm out because they say, OK, well, you were no help because the consulate just basically says the whole time where I'm just following protocol. Yeah. And I can't go past diplomatic Mm -hmm. you know whatever protocol i can't i can't go against that the consular makes a phone call right before the commercial break like dun 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 yeah (laughs) get on the phone quick Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) at the social services offices john like you mentioned the b team come in they work their magic with fisk mrs fisk behind the counter she's very helpful by the way yeah, she is. And I think she she's very had a helpful. thing for Switek. Like, yeah. <laughs> she's like, how much paper do you need? Uh, you need all the papers? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, and she's like the perfect secretary for them to be talking to because they go in there with no warrants or anything. Yeah, she's you know, like, this is all you. supposed to be like disclosed information. Everything's supposed to be anonymous. And they're like, oh, what well, do you want to know? You want to know the parent's name? Do you want to know where they live, their addresses, um, everyone that worked on the case? She mentions right then that the paperwork is filed for confidentiality. So even though they take the paperwork, they can't get all of the information off of it. Yeah, we blocked out her. Yeah, we, it's, or it's, it's under a code. And then, like you mentioned, she said, we want all of it, like how much room you got in your car. So the B team takes all the paperwork and they go back to the precinct. Well, do you mention that she they that there's a person who handles all those? Yes, and she's out of the office. And she's out of the office. So Mrs. Fisk is very helpful, but Angela Mitchell, who's out of the office, is normally the one that handles all the Colombia and El Salvador adoptions. But you need a dedicated person for just those two countries. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> At the precinct, the whole team is going through the paperwork, and there is there's stacks and stacks and stacks of it. Well, not not Crockett. He's making jokes about how they have to go through the paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> so far, Zito mentions that they've gone through 111 Colombian adoptions. And that's when Crockett goes, Bleh. the consulate said there's they only, only do 20 to 25, only a couple dozen. And they find a common thread here that there's just one code for this lawyer. And so they call up Mrs. Fisk. And Mrs. Fisk is like, oh, yeah, that confidential information we're not supposed to give out. That when it says on the paperwork, it just says F35, whatever. That means lawyer. Howard Bamiglia. So she's even willing to give up the information over the phone. <laughs> oh, she's yeah. helping, okay? Yeah. She knows there's a dead baby involved. She's got to help. Now we're going to go on the road with the ladies who are just going to go mess with families. I mean, they I guess they're trying to. Yeah, questions. knock, knock. Can we see your baby? <laughs> Does he have a strawberry on his back? No? Okay. You can put him I just don't know what they hope to accomplish. They, gotta, with a lot they of had these. to find the, the kid. That's what they're accomplishing. If they find that, I understand what you're saying, that they're going around knocking on people's doors like, hey, is that your baby? Are you sure? But if they find that kid, then they have a case. True, true. They just don't have any court authority for doing any of this. Yeah, because you can't go, <laughs> because you can't go to the court and go like, hey, I have this kid. It may not be her kid. Can mm-hmm. she just look at it? If they just ask questions. Yeah. Well, I think that the, that's the whole reason why they went and looked at the paperwork so they could get a judge court order to go talk to all these children and then bring them in and figure out who they but were they not just walk into their backyard they still can't like they have no authority to take them in they can go ask them questions all they want uh, that's no, true they never go inside their house it's not like they break in their house <laughs> bust in steal the kids and then leave they just ask the question and uh if if you are a legitimate if you're a person who has a legitimate child that you've adopted legally then you shouldn't really be worried <laughs> <laughs> so the ladies are on this little road trip that they're going to go around. They stop at one house and the first lady that they talk to, she's like, oh yeah, we dealt with Howard. He was great. He was a saint. We got our child. Everything went great. And then they go to the next house to DeMarco, who's played by Stanley Tucci. I'll come back to that, John. That way you can give mm-hmm. us a little bit more information on Stanley Tucci. And DeMarco says that they had adopted one. His name was Davey. And then he died. And then Howard replaced that one like under a warranty. Essentially, yeah, like that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> it's a, like, like they had a a thirty day warranty. I wonder if he had to pay extra for that. <laughs> it was such a weird conversation, but we do get the information out of it that they pay twenty thousand up front under the legal way, but then thirty thousand under the table. And he also says that he's a pig, right? Yes. He says right away, he's like, that man's a pig. Mm-hmm. I hate that man. He hates him. He doesn't like him, and he's willing to testify. The ladies ask him if he'd be willing to testify against him. In- or not against him, but just testify to a grand jury about Howard. 
And he's like, yeah, absolutely. No, paying $30,000 on the side to get a kid is illegal. So he just kind of admitted to a crime. But I mean, <laughs> we'll just kind of look the other way. I guess they'd be willing to you know, work with him if he's going to testify to the grand jury. Also, can we talk about that when he said <laughs> that he got that they got the baby replaced? He said they got the baby replaced because his wife was so upset about it. So he wasn't upset that the baby died. I don't. That's what I'm saying. It was a really weird conversation because he says the baby died yeah. and then. He called Famiglia because he said, his I wife wanted, was yeah, so upset. The wife was so upset and he wanted his money back and they would just call it even. But Famiglia said, no, I'm going to make it right. And then got them Andrea or Andrea. Yeah. And they didn't have to pay any more money. Because you got, I get you a faulty one. Like, I'm going to make it right because I got you like a defective child or something. Yeah, know. that's what I'm saying. It's like, uh-huh. because Howard treats some like commodities. Lemon. I guess DeMarco really got under my skin because he acted like Howard was a pig. Which he is. I'm not saying he's not a pig. Mm. But you're not much better because, like, you didn't even... He didn't even seem like he cared that the kid died. He just wanted it replaced. Yeah, I, I, like He wanted his money back. Like, I get you, it's like, it, it's like he was acting like he, he dealt with a rude salesman, not like, yeah. <laughs> like this big tragedy had happened where their adopted son died. You know what he was acting like? He was acting like he got a lemon car and he took it back to the dealership and was like, you sold me this car and I got down the road and it broke down and I want a new one. Uh-huh. <laughs> because my wife is so upset so. she can't go grocery shopping in it or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She really wanted a convertible. And she, she won't shut <laughs> so, up about well, her dead I, baby, so give me a new one. <laughs> the only reason I bring up the the fact that it was you know him admitting to a crime because he paid money under the table to make the adoption happen because later when he decides to maybe not testify. This was just a really weird conversation. Yeah, it was very strange and like he was very removed emotionally from the conversation, mm-hmm. I guess is what it is. Yep. Well, John. Danny Tucci has actually been in a crap load of stuff. He's been in movies like The Pelican Brief, Road to Perdition. He was nominated for an award, I think he actually won, for The Lovely Bones. He's been in the all the Hunger Game movies, Transformers of Extinction, and Transformers The Last Night. What's weird there is I think he plays two different characters. Yeah, I saw that too. That he movies. plays two different people. And it's Michael Bay movie who studied under Michael Mann. So that makes sense. You'd have one actor uh, play two different people and pretend like it's not a thing. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, he's been a bunch of tv stuff as well he's one of those actors where they're in a bunch of movies and they always play hoarding role he actually studied acting at state university new york purchase and to bring that up because he actually studied with ving rames oh interesting miami vice yeah, man they, they just they just it's like a well of people they pull from it's or just something. deep spider web of crossover that happens between everyone he is currently married to emily blunt's older sister emily blunt being from like devil wears prada he was actually in that movie he was our co-star in that movie and he also owns several restaurants and has authored two cookbooks stanley tucci cooks the food in transformers <laughs> at the precinct they're reviewing with castillo the duo is going over to see famiglia in just a couple hours everyone is super worked up they want to bring him in but as, as you guys have mentioned castillo's reluctant because they don't have any evidence that directly links famiglia to these crimes so i text just mm-hmm. let's do a wiretap and this is where i mentioned Castillo looks around the room and sees everyone is standing. Everyone was sitting when he when they started. They're all standing around him now, except for Crockett, who's sitting on Croc- on Castillo's desk, like right next to him, leaned in. Like, what about the fifty thousand dollars that he gave th- that he was given? That isn't that enough reason to look into it? Castillo gives in. It's like, okay, I'll make I'll make the phone calls to help you get court orders and stuff like that. And then Zero comes in and says that they found a match for the birthmark, and so now the ladies are off with Maria to go see that child so i mean they have no evidence no evidence they have <laughs> you know over a hundred people who have done this you know i mean just handful of witnesses and oh yeah uh they all paid thirty thousand dollars under the table <laughs> to familia for this so there's like only there was like three million dollars somewhere that would prove that he's selling babies i don't know <laughs> I, 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 I don't know phrase for that it's like a turn of phrase that people refer to like to be able to find those types of crimes yeah. all of this something <laughs> i can't remember <laughs> <laughs> yeah just no evidence you know not not like three million 
pieces of evidence somewhere. <laughs> well, now the ladies are with Maria, and they're just going to walk right into someone's backyard. And Maria does immediately recognize her son, who's playing in the pool. So he's out there with the nanny. And then the mom comes out, and the ladies just immediately say, this child was acquired through an, an illegal adoption. And how do you think the mom is going to react? The mom's like, get the fuck out of here. Yeah, she's like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's yeah. clearly wrong. We have it. It's approved by the state. He's my child. And she doesn't. Yeah. And she's like, you have to leave unless you have a warrant. And they don't have a warrant because they, they have no evidence that they haven't seen these kids yet to know that it's her, it's her kid. So they have to leave. And then after the ladies leave. The mom frantically calls Famiglia at Famiglia's office. The duo are there talking to him. And he's he is a, the dirtbag. He's like, I'm just filling a void that the state can't fill. I'm helping with these adoptions coming from Colombia. We're not doing anything wrong. Crockett, of course, goes for the throat. And he says, we know you're behind the baby smuggling. Three of them died. And Famiglio does like a classic move. He's like, I am so well respected in the community that we would yes. all suffer if you would charge me with a crime. Now, what you're saying is slanderous. Yes. yes. And I have no evidence to that. So uh, it's slanderous. I, I love this guy's arrogance throughout this episode. Basically, his defense is people love kids and gosh darn it, people like me. <laughs> That's his defense. <laughs> yeah, you know, his arrogance reminds me of the episode uh, Bought and Paid For, the rapist oh, yes. arrogance. Like, he was so sure that he... It was very similar, right? Like, he was so sure mm -hmm. that he was going to get away with it that he couldn't resist the temptation to show up at Gina's house, similar to the end of this. Like, he did, he, they set him up, and he went right yeah. into it. <laughs> I just, you know... He felt an awful lot like Artie Ziff for all you <laughs> Simpsons people yeah. out there. <laughs> <laughs> At the social services offices, Angela finally comes back and asks Fisk, like, hey, so anything happened while I was out? And she's like, oh, yeah, the cops came by, took all, literally all of your paperwork, every, every piece of paperwork you've ever filed. They also found this plane of smuggled babies where three of them had died. I'm surprised you hadn't heard of that. She's like, what are you talking about? What dead babies? <laughs> <laughs> she, she was on vacation. She's been out of town. Yeah. <laughs> She basically had the equivalent of getting fired on vacation, right? I mean, <laughs> yes, yes. So I, I want to point out Angela is played by Jane Brucker, who played the older sister on in the movie Dirty Dancing. Her name was Lisa um, in Dirty Dancing. <laughs> okay. I just got, Lisa. I bring her up because Hector, who is played by Brian Brucker O'Connor, they met on the set of the show and Eventually, they would get married, then divorced in 93. One thing right. that did kind of get me off, off guard, though, a little bit is her name is Jane Brucker. His name is Brian Brucker O'Connor. And for a minute, there, I was like, well, is it is it hyphen? Did he take her last name? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I Maybe just, it was a business move. <laughs> She's a yes. better actor. <laughs> yes. So, but yes, I did thought I find that was interesting that they ended up they they were became a couple after the baby stealing episode. Also, after what married. he does to her in the episode. Oh yeah, yeah, he <laughs> yes. kills her in the episode. Yeah, <laughs> they mar she married him after he murdered her in the episode. <laughs> Sorry, but if you murdered Maybe me in an episode, I wouldn't get over it. I wonder <laughs> the Famiglia office. This is when the B team is outside. They have their wiretap. They hear the phone call come in of a woman saying they have to talk right away. So then, and that they're going to talk at the beach walk. So then the B team follows Famiglia down to the beach walk, and it's Famiglia and Angela, and they're walking along the beach. And the B team is trying to use like one flowers. of those. <laughs> yeah, I know he's got a flower. He's smelling it. <laughs> Trying to eat, feed it to her. I don't know. Something weird. The B team's using like one of those cone microphones too, trying to pick up their conversation from far away, but it's not working out. The conversation between Famiglia and Angela is that Angela's disgusted that this was happening with the babies, just how they were moving. I mean, I don't know what you thought was going to happen when you're a part of a ring to smuggle children out of Colombia. She must have thought they were coming in like fancy cribs with nurses attached to them. I don't know what she was thinking. I don't know, whatever. And then she asked him about the, the dead babies and he says it's just spoilage. But and she's very upset. But he reminds her like, hey, you, if you go talk to anyone, I'll take you down too. Yep. So just keep that and in all, mind. So people like me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Make sure to point out like, don't worry. People like me. It'll be and okay. Then, she storms off and then he leaves himself a voice note on his tape recorder 
to have Hector follow Which Angela not, and keep a log. Yeah, and not a bright idea to record your illi- your thoughts on your <laughs> illegal activities while being investigated by Vice. Um, so, which is weird to me that that never comes up later in the episode. The recorder like was just kind of in there at the end of the scene. <laughs> that was it. There was there was no importance behind the tape recorder except like, hey, this is an '80s thing to do. <laughs> apparently, apparently, it's also common in the '80s for children to be left outside in a swing by themselves this could have been solved all these threats and everything could be solved if you just don't leave your freaking kid outside by itself <laughs> in a swing because <laughs> hector comes this woman's gardening hector she goes inside so i'll be right back baby and goes inside leaves the kid alone in the swing in the, the backyard DeMarco's house you should mention mm-hmm. it's the demarco mm-hmm. baby and then hector comes out of the bushes puts a note on the baby so when the mom comes out sees the note that says mommy don't let's see what does it say it says mommy, quote don't mommy please don't testify so then when the yeah. ladies come back they're following up on demarco he suddenly changed his tune but Miglia is an all right guy. Uh, DeMarco just has a bad memory. And Trudy lays down a pretty good line. She says, if I was you, I'd take a memory course because we're not dropping this. <laughs> is there those things? So There's memory courses? Was, <laughs> so what I was alluding to earlier, they can still try to uh, charge the DeMarcos with a crime. They illegally paid. They bought a child. Like, like they exactly. kind of have... Well, yeah, All but these I, people. Go ahead. I, I think that's uh, what they, they were they, trying to say at the end, though. That they're saying, like, this is not done. We're not through. This is not over. We're going to come back and we're going to basically force, we can force you to testify. But he's like, but he says, well, you can, you can force me to testify all you want, but I'm not going to say, I'm just going to sit up there and say this. But still, they, that's what they're saying at the end. Like, where this is not over, Trudy storms off because she's angry. But in the end, it's supposed to be like, it's not done. We're going to figure out a way to get you to testify. Which is what's interesting so. because. At the precinct, their case is kind of falling apart, and Castillo just says, we'll start turning up the pressure, and they're going to go turn up the pressure on Angela, which also means that they could have just turned up the pressure on these parents. Exactly. That's yeah, true. so they're, they're all sitting around like, what can we do? What can we do? We have no evidence. We have no evidence, and we have no witnesses, <laughs> and there's no way to get people to testify, and if only we had evidence, you know, like maybe some $3 million or something, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we'd have a case, you know, because we'd have we, we would have witnesses and evidence, but we don't have either of those. I don't know. John's like Perry Mason. Like, <laughs> right down you notes. Do. I saw that law and order. I know how this works. <laughs> the duo go straight over to see Angela. They slap her with a subpoena. And then, of course, Hector's there, so he sees it and makes a phone call. But Miglia is getting this in multiple ways. He sees that the vice team is working his people hard. Then he has lunch with the consulate, who says he wants out, and he's not going to give Miglia, he's not going to help him with giving him diplomatic immunity because the consulate could have the consular could have diplomatic immunity and then also extend that to Miglia. And so that conversation ends with Miglia says he'll take care of Angela. And then, well, that covers that, meaning everyone's dead. I want to point out two things. One, Crockett has a future at being a process server. <laughs> he, he should stick with it. He's very intimidating. I love the consulate guy's reason for not wanting to help. Because if they get caught, they might ship him somewhere crappy. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it here in America. I don't want to be shipped to some of the, one of them... One of them poor countries. <laughs> <laughs> like where I'm from. <laughs> this is when everyone does turn up dead. Famiglia has Hector kill the consular and then go kill Angela and then stage it so it looks like a murder-suicide and that they were responsible for the children's smuggling ring. So he would go, they would go down for that, but both of them are dead. So that's that. And the uh, duo run into a detective that is not willing to help them because they want to dust the entire place for prince it's like that's a waste of time and he's not that bright though (laughs) come on now he is going over and above to convince them that the case is closed go home nothing to see here (laughs) we don't have to do any investigating everything is all good and buttoned up and with a ribbon on it you know like you almost get the feeling because in one of the next scenes, Crockett's talking to him on the phone and Crockett's like threatening to call his boss, you know, and he's still pitching it like everything's fine. They clearly kill each other. Why do we need to investigate? It's not like we're cops. <laughs> I know. Um, 
Which I, I love that they that Rocket threatens like, do I need to have my lieutenant call your your lieutenant? And as soon as he says that, Castillo turns and walks away. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, crap. Yeah. Like, I have nothing to do with this. It's like, do I have to have my dad call your dad? No. Eventually, it does pay off because they find that detective has to eat crow big time. <laughs> yeah, because they found one print. It belongs to Hector Borges, Famiglia's chauffeur, on the front door. Yeah, and the guy, the guy who brings it out, like of all places, was on the front door. Who would have thought? Like all sarcastic. <laughs> I was trying to figure out what he did for them because they find out. Uh, so they they look into it and find out that Hector is chauffeur. All I heard him say when I was watching the episode was that he worked for the the lawyer's office. I was like, so is he like a janitor and a thug? <laughs> like trying to picture like what does the thug do for the lawyers? You know. So okay, so he's, he's a chauffeur and a thug. He drives them around. <laughs> I mean, that's what any good crime ring would have. Their murderer is their driver. I mean, it's not a very good yeah. idea because then if you get he gets caught, you have no one to drive you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Get away, car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now the vice team goes with backup to serve Hector. And after running around and playing cop inside of his house, they find him. He's dead, hanging inside of the closet with an explosive attached to it. And they dive right out before the commercial break. And the tubs of Crockett are okay. Uh, the tubs dive was amazing, though. He, like, <laughs> smiles and then closes yes. his eyes and jumps. It's like, why do you have that look on your face? <laughs> so, and I actually, I, I actually read a little bit about this. It turns out tub stuntman actually caught fire <gasps> and burned up his legs. Oh, my uh, God. Oh, wow. With a business. He quit the business after that. He stopped being a stunt guy after that episode because he actually wow. burned up his legs. It's yes. not even worth it like for that stupid scene. Yeah, it's just a every, dumb scene. Every time I hear, hear like stunt people, I'm like, why would you even do this? It's not worth it for this stupid scene that doesn't even matter in the show. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't even need to do that. Why, that. why did Hector have to have an explosive attached to him? Why would Famiglia all of a sudden want to kill police officers? Why would he want that on him? Because then it's personal. Why was the B team driving Tubbs caddy? <laughs> True. Because their bug van doesn't work. No. That pink and blue thing. They there was drive a whole down. lot that didn't make sense with that scene. <laughs> also, can we talk about how like Tubbs is nowhere in this episode? Like hardly, he's not in anything. He's hardly in any of the episodes, it, the scenes. It is weird. He just His doesn't absence. care about babies. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about that too. Save that. Save that okay, for so your my, final okay, thoughts. Okay, yeah, that, save yeah, that okay. for your final thoughts. You do have a good point there. <laughs> okay. Let's get to the end of this episode. <laughs> yes. We have a quick stop over at the precinct where they're upset. They're running ragged. They can't put these things together. They finally decide to set up a sting operation with a reporter that Trudy knows. Make it look like with Maria that she's just coming to the country. She's looking for a child. The, the police have a lead on this child smuggling ring, which will lure Famiglia out to try and kill Maria. So now we're set up at the hospital, quote unquote hospital, which is I forgot to mention earlier. Every scene in this episode was supposed to be hospital. Or the office is clearly the building, that high end apartment building that's in the opening credits with the with the red stairs and the slide in it. Yep. Because you can see and that stuff slide, in the background. Yeah. yeah but whatever. Yeah, the, the, it's the, a staircase. The, the wall door for whatever it's called. So they have everything set up. They've done the newscast to say that they've got her. So it's going to lure Bamiglia out. And he falls hook, line, and sinker for it. He shows up at the hospital. He gets on the elevator. The vice team is spread out throughout the hospital. And they Switek follows if, him. If in. only he didn't. If only he didn't kill his thug already. I mean, <laughs> he'd have someone else to go execute this. Well, yeah, and he, yeah, he he'd, tries have, he'd have someone else to go execute her. I mean, he even had to drive himself to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so Switek follows him into the elevator. He stops at the fourth floor and sees that there's police there that goes up to the fifth floor, which I have a question of why he even showed up when the news report said she is under heavy police security because and why he thought that he could do this. Ego. Yeah, I'm it's telling true. you, it's why it's like bought and paid Janice, for. He's got a huge ego. He thinks he can do whatever he wants. <laughs> and Janice, the fifth floor nurse, was expecting him. <laughs> And then he goes up to the fifth floor. Turns out he just happened to have a class set up that night. So then he could talk to unwed mothers. I don't know what he's talking to unwed pregnant women for. Because they did their babies. Because he's going to set up adoptions for their yeah, babies. That's what the, yeah. Harsh, Miami Vice. That's harsh. What, that's what that was about. Just because they're unwed doesn't mean they have to give up their babies. It was unwed mothers. <laughs> and they were setting up videos. If they, if The video said that in the video, it said like, 
adoption is a wonderful like the only thing i was paying attention to was that nun dropping fire on swy texting that the eating disorder meeting was down the hall ouch i know <laughs> yes yeah. she was a mean nun anyway uh, on the third floor yeah so but yeah i, I love the the movie kind of begins and it's like your baby and you narrated by james earl jones <laughs> So you got knocked up. <laughs> so, of course, Pamiglia sneaks out the back. The vice team's tense. They don't know what he's doing there, when he's going to make his move. The glass is supposed to last for 45 minutes. He sneaks out the back. He goes to this giant grate. Climbs. Big enough for a man. Gigantic. <laughs> Jesus, how much air do they need in this building? <laughs> you could he could sit a there. <laughs> He could drive his car without a chauffeur right through it. So. He's walking down or crawling. He could walk. He could probably stand up and walk <laughs> down this air vent. He's going down the air vent, and you see in the room, the hospital room, that there's someone in the bed. And I and I knew. Now, hold, first of all. You did not know. You asked. <laughs> first of all, no in Miami Vice, they would totally keep Maria there and just let her be executed in exchange no, for getting the No, they would criminal. not. There's lots of evidence to suggest no. that they would do something like that. But two, I was really, really hoping that it was Tubbs underneath <laughs> that blanket. <laughs> Tubbs wearing like a nightdress and a cap on his head. <laughs> Hospital gown. I, mean, I was happy to see that it was Gina because when Famiglia opens up the grate, he holds out his gun and then the vice team jumps out and says freeze he turns like towards crockett and of course like not crockett and everyone just unloads on him in in the vent and it turns out that gina is the one that's that's in the bed and that's the end of famiglia we have just one last scene before the episode's over where we go with maria to totally go cool. pe- just kill him arrest him <laughs> i mean totally I'm fine gonna come, you know it's i'm gonna like come back to, to that. prove any of this <laughs> I'm going to come back to the Miami Vice ending here on this one. Okay. There is just one last scene at the house where Ma- Maria's son is. And the vice team is escorting her with the FBI or something along those lines that they're going to take her son back from this rich family who is, by the way, is rich enough. They could afford to let Maria live on their property. Yeah. <laughs> let's not discuss that. <laughs> well, uh- but there's also no one left alive, so they can't really prove anything. They keep saying they have no evidence, so <laughs> why would they have to give their kid back? Get off my property. This is our kid. Everyone's crying. It's a very sad, you know, because you think about the situation where you think that you've done not necessarily everything right, but that things have just worked out now. You have a child, finally. Uh, for the record, not everyone is crying. The dad doesn't do crap. No. He just stands there. And then he only gets upset when his wife gets upset. He never even says anything to the child. He, he never wanted, even says goodbye to him. Because he wanted a red car, not a blue car. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> and then Maria decides at the last minute to let Alex stay with the family, which really means that Con- Concha is going to raise. Concha, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Concha, the nanny, is actually going to raise Six. that child. Yeah, that book, I know. I know I probably shouldn't say this, but that really bugged the crap out of me, too. Like, I really want this kid, but I've got four nannies. They're like, they had a bunch of nannies, not yeah. just her. There was a bunch of people in the background when they first showed up at that place. Like, they have so many nannies, they could have hired Maria as a as nanny. As a nanny, yeah. <laughs> but, dude, they were sweating it. They're like, we're about to lose our gig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's why Concha's like, no, like, no, no. Oh, thank God, we're not going to lose our job. <laughs> So Maria goes running back. She decides that Alex can stay with the family. She goes running back to the van. Trudy takes off after her. We freeze frame. And that's the end of the episode. So it is a very sad ending to this episode and very realistic because it makes you think, what would I do in that situation? It's my child, but he doesn't know me. He knows them as his parents. So right. would you be willing yeah. to rip a child from what from their parents? Yep. Punch him right in the <laughs> face and take my baby back. <laughs> You, you know He'll what forget. I would be doing. He's only like two. He'll I, I, forget. If Miglia's house looking for that three million dollars. <laughs> it's gone, John. He spent it on hookers and blow. It's already gone. <laughs> <laughs> he spent it on a new chauffeur. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end of the episode. And we have some final thoughts. And I think we should save those. I have one yes. that is about uh, the writing that I'll come back to. Uh, so I think we all have a big point we want to make at the end of this episode. <laughs> but before we get that, just to reassure everyone, I, I think we're all in agreement. This is a really good episode. We may have been hard on it throughout this rundown, but it's really yes. good. I think yeah. what it is is that we were, we yeah, were it, trying to find the lighter moments. 
to yeah. make this episode more that true. Yeah. Yeah. I, exactly. I feel like like we're a little cynical at times, uh, or in, uh, I know when I watch the episodes that we kind of almost look for the plot holes in the episodes uh, in, in a way because we're trying to make this entertaining and we're trying mm-hmm. to find things to joke about while we break down the episodes but this is this actually was a really good really heavy episode it was really good and i think that it was out of like desperation like find the stuff that doesn't make that much sense or some potholes in here because this story is so sad and they know that it's still a thing that yeah. mm-hmm. that is dealt with in this country that that ch- children are stolen from their homes in other countries and brought here and parents have almost no recourse to figure out what happened. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes we have to uh, inject a little bit of humor and levity, you know, so that if we don't have such a, you know, a 50 minute podcast of some heavy, depressing stuff. Well, I think we could probably do 50 minutes of us just crying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this, this was a very sad, sad story. And on that note, let's go talk about the music. <laughs> <laughs> That's also a sad story. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All right, John. I think we, we joked that this was kind of a sad story of music, but I think you're kind of in agreement with that. They really kind of hung me out to dry here, guys. Um, <laughs> we have Hanging by a Thread by Mike and the Mechanics. We've already talked about Mike and the Mechanics. They're the British supergroup and side project of Mike Rutherford, who was the bassist of Genesis. So not only have we already talked about them, but Mike and the Mechanics themselves, they were mildly successful from the mid 80s to the mid 90s. And other than being saying like they released X album with X song, there's really nothing interesting. It's pretty much Mike Rutherford and a handful of session musicians, something just that just for him to do on the side of of Genesis. And I literally was looking for anything I could kind of go off on the tangent about to talk about. I even considered talking about John Irish early, who played saxophone on the album. Wasn't even in the band, just played sax on the album. <laughs> okay. He was best known for his solo on the thin on Thin Lizzy's Dancing in the Moonlight and the Clashes the Right Profile from the London Calling. But that's about as interesting as it gets. <laughs> Really quickly, let's talk about the other maybe the other artists will give me something to talk about. We have Love You by Joan Armatrading. So she is a British singer singer songwriter. This is the first time we're, we're talking about her. Okay, that's a plus. She did kind of pop with a jazz and blues influence, a little bit of folk in there. Uh, she was a three time Grammy Award nominee. She has a career spanning of over forty years and, and released eighteen albums. She did a number of firsts. She was the first female British artist to debut at number one on the billboards blue chart she was the first uk female nominated for a grammy in the blues category in fact she was the first british female to enjoy international success i mean period you know let alone being the first black british female to actually make it on on the international charts like in the u.s and stuff so she's actually pretty iconic yeah, I mean, but, well accomplished yeah. too, right? A lot of albums, very well respected, yeah. a lot of awards. Yeah, and, you know, and I, I feel like with her too, if I was a little older or if I was British, like I would know her more. One thing that was kind of interesting was her first job was as an engineering tool manufacturer at the age of 15, but she was fired for playing her guitar during tea breaks. <laughs> that's I, very I, British. So, I guess you're <laughs> during yes. tea breaks. Yes, I'm up. saying that's super British. But I guess yes. it's also a credit to like everyone's meant to do something and you just keep sometimes it'll just work out. She was clearly yeah, made so, to make music. Yeah. So but I mean once again, aside from saying she released X album on X day and hit the and made it to the top twenty on this album or uh there's not a whole lot of interesting. She's had a really long career. She seems like a swell lady. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she, she, I, I guess what I'm getting at is there's no drug issues. There's no cheating, infidelity stories. There's no pillow fighting therapy <laughs> sessions. Only thing that would tie the two of these groups together 
is that the drummer for Mike and the Mechanics, Peter, the original drummer, Peter Van Hook, created and produced Live from Abbey Road, which oh. ran from 2006 to 2009. It aired in, on, on the BET on Channel 4. I do remember Live from Abbey Road was also shown on the IFC channel. And I bring that up because Joe and Arbitrating in the second season, episode three, was her show of live on abbey road in 2007 live from abbey road is they would take an artist to abbey road studios where the beatles recorded their favorite famous album Mm -hmm. and they would basically do a set of their music the only reason i know is like i said i actually used to watch it on ifc specifically because they did a few uh uh, like i watched the nora jones episode because i am man enough to say i am a nora jones fan Don't know why is a fantastic song. There's live from Abbey Road connection. There's your music. <laughs> Don't sound bitter at all, John. <laughs> I I can't be too bitter because there was absolutely no mention of David Bowie, and <laughs> other than mentioning Genesis, I completely avoided talking about Phil Collins. So. <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode, because I think think we're a little worked up about a few things in this episode. All right, Melissa, I've kicked off this, our final thoughts for a few weeks in a row. Let's turn this over to you. What are your final thoughts on this episode? Okay, so first of all, I will say I like this episode. It's a good episode. It is a strong episode emotionally, right? It's powerful, I would say. That the way it was written and the way it's done, it's very powerful and it makes you think about the stuff that was that goes on with adoption and what was going on then. And, you know, there's all those parts to it that make it, especially being a mother and, and having children, it's, it's emotional to think about that someone could take your baby from you and you could never see them again. And you, no matter how hard you try, because you're from another country and you don't have the resources, obviously, too, that you may never find your child. And then if you do find your child like her, like Maria. She found her child and she did what she thought was right. She didn't want to hurt him. You know, she loved him so much that she didn't want to hurt him and take him away from the people, the only people he knew. So it's, it is, it's really sad. And you're right. We, we, we were picking on it, but it was because we were desperate to find things to make it lighter than what it really was. Mm-hmm. It was so super heavy. And the only thing I have that really bugs me and for years it has bugged me since I watched this episode originally and since um since since what i'm going to say has such a big effect on me watching the show and like how i feel about the show it's the part where tubs to me it feels like this is just one season or just how many months after his own baby has died 10 episodes yeah right he doesn't know that he still he doesn't know that the baby is alive he always thinks the baby's dead his son is his dead don't you think he should be like, I feel like he should be super emotional. Obviously, Crockett should be emotional because he has a child and yes, mm-hmm. but like it should Crockett hit him. has a kid. <laughs> yeah, I know. He has a kid. Um, yeah. And <laughs> th- but I'm saying like he should be like you think that this would be a good opportunity for the writers to give to make Tubbs have more depth. He's got a, this sad story. And I feel like that's a story that you made him have this sad story that everyone he ever loves blows up in a car. <laughs> <laughs> but they never give him the opportunity to grieve that or to like shed light on how that would feel to be a father, to lose your child, and then have to go and do this brutal job where you're investigating these innocent babies that are on this plane who do have done nothing. Nobody's done anything. You know, the babies did nothing wrong, but they died. And he's like, eh. <laughs> I mean, yeah, everyone's emotional, but he's like, they didn't even show him at all in this episode. Mm-hmm. So it's just frustrating to me that it feels like it was an opportunity to make, I will say, I feel like Tubbs is an underdeveloped main character. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things you don't know about Tubbs. Like, mm-hmm. why do we not know where he lives? Why do we not know? You know, why don't we see his personal life? Sometimes we don't see Crockett's, but a lot of times we do. And I feel like that it's an opportunity where they could have given him more depth. And it's a sad episode. It's a good episode. It's well written. It's an episode they could submit for an emmy (laughs) i am disappointed that they did not give tub some emotion on what had happened in his life and i do i'm with you i really like this episode i think that they did a really good job of staying on point that it never pulls back from it gets slapstick or they like make a turn this would be an easy episode to have like for investigating this baby smuggling thing because because we want to call attention to it but also there's drugs and the high life and then it just have it be a subplot of something else that's happening but this is the main plot point Mm -hmm. but this is that's the only thing that that this episode is about uh i so i 
I really liked it. I really appreciated that that they dug deep into it. It stayed on tone the entire time. The bad guy was a real bad guy. You you really get to hate him throughout the episode because of his arrogance and he's not just using it's not just one aspect of his business or something like that and that he sees them as commodities and there's some spoilage and stuff like that so all of it is it, it hits you real hard in the heart and i really do and i really did like this episode i think that it was well done there was the one thing that is bugging me right now and it's not necessarily with this episode just with my advice in general is that can't we arrest somebody can't we put yeah. some handcuffs on someone and put them in the back of a police car? Yeah. Everyone's mm-hmm. just got to end up dead at, at the end of I the episode. Like that, I, I just want to say this one thing about that is that I feel like that would have been more satisfying. Mm-hmm. Like seeing him get arrested yeah. and get cuffs put on him and have to actually go to jail. But otherwise, mm-hmm. it was great. I liked it. Everyone was acting was good. I joked in the beginning of the episode when the vice team works together on a common cause so like a well-oiled machine. Hey, the ladies, the B team, the B team is super efficient. They're getting shit done. The duo are running stuff down. Everyone knew what their jobs were. Castillo just needed to get himself out of the way. John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? I, I didn't even think about it until you, until Melissa brought it up, or, or at least it came up for the episode about about the tubs, you know, thing. And then it was like, wow, you know, he really is kind of checked out in this episode. There really isn't a whole lot about, I mean, there, he really isn't featured at all in the episode. And yeah, he just lost his baby. Like, he should be the most adamant about what's going on. I mean, I'm with you guys that I really enjoyed the episode. I thought it was a fantastic episode. And I felt like it, for season three, we're finally getting back on track because we had that goofy kind of episode with... With the Isman. With <laughs> yeah, Izzy, Izzy last Izzy, week. Yeah. And so yeah. we kind of... You know, and I made the comment last week that it felt like we kind of stepped back into the previous seasons, kind of got back to that the way that season three is and how much more serious it, it's been. I mean, I, I've been making uh, making jokes throughout the uh, throughout this episode, but uh, I really did enjoy it. And I really did think that it was uh, really just a heavy episode, really well done how they did it. There was just that one plot hole that I kind of honed in on early in the episode, and it just bugged me throughout the episode. Like, why does no one follow the money? The money's got to go somewhere. Three million dollars somewhere <laughs> kept hanging around throughout the whole episode. And at the very end, they kill everyone's dead that was involved with the smuggling ring. The people who flew in on the plane. The people who set up the adoptions, the guy who was making all the money, even the the consulate guy who was looking the other way and green lighting them. Everyone's dead. It was very unsatisfying. It would have been more satisfying had someone been arrested because it was very un- unsatisfying that everyone was dead. It never happened. Uh, and that's why I was mentioning it's like it's just been a theme. We've been stuck yeah. in this rut. You could harp on the that last end scene where it's like, well, legally, they probably couldn't take the kid because there's no evidence anymore because they murdered everybody i see why they did that scene i feel like her saying no you can you can he can stay with you he, i was kind of torn on that because it, there was a part of me that was thinking like how realistic is that that, that she's just going to give up her kid after sneaking onto a plane flying to america to try and find him and get her kid back and going through all that. And then she's just going to be like, well, you're better off here. I don't know. And I think it's just credit to Vice willing to do the unpopular thing. Yeah, because yeah, everyone wants that... her to go to take him back. It's her baby. She should mm-hmm. take him home. But, you know, I yeah. don't know. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. You can tell we actually did really enjoy this episode of Miami Vice, both because it was a good episode but both, and also because we had a lot of fun together after watching it. We hope you enjoyed this mm-hmm. episode of the podcast. We would love, love, love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Let us know what your thoughts are on this episode and what you think of Miami Vice willing to tackle this topic. So we, we would love to hear from you what your thoughts are on this episode and then what you think of Miami Vice willing to tackle this, especially on network TV on primetime, that they're willing to tackle this episode of an adoption ring. Let us know what you think. Go with the heat at gmail.com. Check out the website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the ways to contact us and how to subscribe. Check out our YouTube channel. Uh, you can, if you're stuck in a position where you can't get the RSS on your work computer or something like that, but you got access to YouTube, we got you. We got you back. You'd be able to go to YouTube and be able to listen to this show. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you all next time. And don't forget, we're still looking for Tubbs Jr. <laughs> yeah. We haven't forgot about that. We are still searching. If you have, if you have seen Baby Tubbs, please write or email us. 
You're like, we need to get a P.O. box now. Yes, no. <laughs> oh, and hi, Trudy. <laughs> hi, Trudy. <laughs> <laughs>